a listener to a radio program on gardening called in asking for advice on pruning fruit trees. Explaining how to go about it, the expert remarked that it is surprising the amount of dead wood one can shake out of a very good tree after a hard winter, and the necessity of pruning and cutting back branches in order to produce fruit. My friends, the gospel is telling us that it is amazing the amount of dead wood that can be found in a good life. In many ways, our lives are no different from a garden. If we are to get the best out of them, then we need to care and be cultivated. We must take the advice of Jesus, the master gardener, and rid ourselves of weeds and briars, which if left unchecked will choke and destroy Christian growth. This means cutting away what is useless and nourishing what is good. The pruning Christ is talking about is a cleansing of the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. As a Christian, it is not always easy to stay in good spiritual shape. Even the best of lives can benefit from a little pruning. The good fruit that we are expected to bear is love of our neighbor in word and deed. This is the test of our genuineness because it has the stamp of the love of Christ imprinted on it. How very wrong it is to close our hearts and turn our backs on the people next door by gossiping about them, spreading scandal, running them into the ground, and taking away their good name. There is no individual alive today without faults, and even the best of people can be torn apart on their weaker or blinder side. The decision to live love has its price. And we should not minimize the difficulties involved. Barriers of hatred and prejudice cannot be broken down to make way for kindness and tolerance unless we are prepared to heal our speech by pruning our tongues. If Jesus is to influence the world, it will be through his followers living in such a way that people will see the hand of God at work in the most ordinary situations in our lives. Christ is dependent upon us being his hands, his feet, his voice, carrying his redemption to others. The greatest contribution any one of us can make to the well-being of the church and the community in which we are connected is to allow Christ, the true vine's love, to seep into each of our branches. If we are connected to Christ and he to us, the fruit we can bear is beyond our collective imagination. Today presents us yet another opportunity to reflect on the depth of our personal, inward, and enduring commitment to the gospel, because apart from the true vine, there will be no lasting growth. Some groups never gel because they never succeed in getting beyond the agenda of the strongest and loudest member of the organization. This is true of biological or blended families, neighborhood groups, or large corporate mergers, and yes, church families too. 
If bitter turf wars become regular occurrences, no group will live up to its vision, its very reason for existing. It will splinter instead into smaller groups, usually full of laying blame on everyone beyond themselves. Today's gospel is a part of Jesus' teaching at the Last Supper, in the midst of the apostles still trying to understand why Jesus washed their feet. Jesus switches gears and uses a metaphor of nature. He is the vine, he tells them, to whom they must stay connected. During their meal, the twelve might have thought this would be easy, but a few hours later in the garden, they realized it would be anything but easy. Even after Jesus rose from the dead, it took them time to realize what Jesus was trying to teach them. And they were tempted to fracture apart and go their separate ways. Like the apostles, we stay connected to Christ and to one another by celebrating a sacred meal, Eucharist, regularly, consistently in our lives. When we are tempted to cease being the communion with each other, it is the Eucharist that reminds us what is really important in and out of a church setting. Like the apostles, we stay connected to Christ and to one another by facing our differences in the light of our faith. Our first reading today reminds us that some Christians were still very much afraid of Paul after he had become one of them. More than a few of them breathed a sigh of relief when they put him on a boat to Tarsus. Paul and Peter had a difference of opinion about what Christians should expect from Gentiles who wanted to follow Jesus. Paul prevailed, not because he had a stronger personality. He certainly did not outrank Peter, but Paul's, Paul's position was determined, was in more harmony with Jesus' teaching. We all know firsthand from our own personal experiences that forming factions within a parish is quite easy to do. Eucharist will never paper over serious differences within a church or any given parish. However, it always provides the proper context for working toward a win-win situation one that does its best to respect each individual and Christ most of all. Belonging to a parish, any community of believers, requires patience, perseverance, surrender. Just when you settle in, everything changes, the priest moves, and the next week you have to deal with their replacements. Cultures, genders, different spiritualities clash. There is no end to the frustrations and problems that come our way as church. Anything from a leaky roof to the constant need for more parishioners to volunteer within our parish. So why is it we keep coming back to this same place week after week. Why invest time and energy and resources in making it all a go? Because, simply put, we believe that being a follower of Jesus Christ is not a me and God affair. Our relationship with Jesus Christ has to be rooted in a community of people, people who are trying to be the hands and feet and the voice of Christ each day. If we allow ourselves, we will be able to learn the blessings of being thrown together 
with people we might not otherwise ever meet, yet are nevertheless our brothers and sisters in Christ. Around any parish, and we are by no means an exception, there is a cast of characters straight from the Gospels. We have our Peters, great guys proclaiming their beliefs, but a little shaky on the follow-through. We have our Marthas, who have great mental debates with the Lord about always getting stuck with refreshment duty. Or those among us like that persistent woman in Luke's parable of the unjust judge, who drives us just a little bit crazy, ever trying to recruit us for every conceivable parish project or program. Most of us would like to remain on the parish sidelines, sit in the back pew, and hope to remain invisible. But we dare not. Jesus is not interested in helping us hide out. Through his parish, through this community of believers, he will continue to make inconvenient demands on our time, inviting himself over for dinner on short notice, as he did with Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Then the next thing we know, Life just isn't the same anymore. And that, my dear friends, is the whole point. In Christ, life isn't supposed to be business as usual. For our business is to be his business. God's demand on a lot of his children is expecting them, the church, a vibrant community, by living good and fruitful lives. In the spirit of Easter transformation, Easter grace, Easter peace, may we have the wisdom and the love to realize and rejoice in our belonging to each other, attached always to the vine which is Jesus Christ as a child of the Father. Amen.